Hi, and welcome back, River Watchers. It's been a wild weather ride in the Southwest over the last few months. We've gone from one extreme to the other, and then back again. We're going to look at where our major reservoir levels are now, and we have a lot of basin bin stories to get to, so let's jump right in. Now back in June, we covered how mild the spring of 2023 was in the desert southwest. Las Vegas even broke its own record for most consecutive days under 100 degrees Fahrenheit, with 294 straight days under 100, which broke the previous record set back in 1964. Within a week of releasing that update, we went from one extreme to the other, and the heat of summer suddenly dropped like a hammer. We soon set another record in Las Vegas with July 2023 becoming the hottest month in Las Vegas weather history, with an average daily temperature of 97.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The usual summer heat streak wouldn't last though, because Hurricane Hillary was on the way in late August. And though the storm itself would later be seen as a bit of a dud here in the Las Vegas area, the days leading up to it is what brought some real weather and problems to Lake Mead. Constant high winds and rain late Friday whipped the lake into a frenzy, much like I described in our Deadliest Park video. These violent waters went on to cause extensive damage to one of the most popular marinas, Las Vegas Boat Harbor, and some of the boats docked there. A couple people were even stranded as some pieces of the floating dock were damaged and became detached from the marina. Accordingly, the National Park Service closed the park from Saturday through Monday in anticipation of the actual storm that was forecasted to pass through during that time. As mentioned before, however, the storm itself ended up being a dud. All the damage was done days before the storm was predicted to come through. Thankfully, no one was injured and boaters assisted everyone stuck on the floating dock. Owners of the boat harbor started to assess the damage and rebuild, which they estimate may approach $1 million. It ripped apart the docks um, at many different locations and just caused uh, untold damage. It's bad. Meanwhile, just west of Lake Mead in Las Vegas up at Charleston Peak, or Mount Charleston as it's called by many, the same storm hit with a much higher intensity. As you can see from these videos, roads were washed out, trees were uprooted, and a water main broke, prompting a boil water notice for residents on the mountain. The governor called 100 National Guard members to active duty to assist getting potable water and supplies to stranded residents and help evacuate visitors stuck at the cabins. Surely you must be wondering whether all this increased storm activity has impacted lake levels much. And the answer is, no, not really. As the SNWA explains in this tweet, when we see even significant rainfall in the Las Vegas Valley, you are looking at best tenths of an inch in changes. And indeed, after all the storm activity, there was only around a 0.16 inch increase in the lake level. As many of you river watchers already know, the biggest impacts on our major reservoir levels are decided number one by the winter snowpack and number two by the USBR controlling flows. As the historic spring runoff has slowed to a trickle this late in the year now, that really only leaves the USBR to more heavily manage flows in order to achieve the intended effect in reservoir levels. For a while, that intended effect was to stave off Deadpool upstream at Lake Powell and save the power plant, so the USBR let Powell take the lion's share of historic spring runoff while Lake Mead continued to decline. Within the last few months, however, that intended effect has shifted, and the USBR is now focused on balancing storage in both reservoirs. According to the Bureau, they have forecasted that Lake Mead will reach 1,065 feet by the end of September. As we take a look at the water level report at the lake today, you can see we are already there at 1,065 feet above sea level, increasing around 9 feet since last report. On the water level graph, you can see Lake Mead begin to top off though as the USBR implements their flow plan and the downstream delivery requirements become fulfilled. Lake Mead still owes approximately 2 million acre feet or 20% of its yearly delivery requirement downstream by terms of the river compact, and the USBR only has a little over a month left to deliver it. That water either has to come from Lake Mead or from its upstream donor, Lake Powell, which now sits at 3,575 feet above sea level, declining around 8 feet since last report. On Powell's graph, we can see the lion's share of spring runoff entering the reservoir earlier in the year here, and then slowly declining as the snowmelt dwindles and the USBR simultaneously shifts operations to balance Lake Mead downstream. Last year, 
Lake Powell dropped so low that reclamation officials were worried it might damage the hydropower infrastructure at Glen Canyon Dam. They released extra water from the dams further upstream in Colorado and Utah to prop up the water level at Lake Powell. And they held back water that was supposed to go downstream to Lake Mead, all while accounting for that water as if it was actually contained in Mead. A sort of accounting trick they call operational neutrality, which also helped stave off mandatory drought restrictions downstream in California during the worst of the drought last year. We covered all this in a previous update I'll link to below if you are interested in learning more. Fortunately, thanks to the healthy winter and spring we had this year, they are now refilling all of those reservoirs and reaccounting for all that missing water. This all was made possible by the perfect storm of events, including historic winter snowpack in some basin states, the predicted El Nino cycle that we'll talk about more in a minute, and also the continued water conservation efforts by users in a growing southwest. In Las Vegas, the SNWA's efforts to reduce the amount of grass at homes, businesses, and government sites has already saved millions of gallons of water. Other areas targeted by the SNWA include artificial water features like fountains and ponds and a golf course construction ban. On the contrary, some argue that removing too much vegetation creates so-called heat islands inside a city composed of steel and concrete. It is argued that these heat islands actually accelerate drought symptoms and temperature increases. We'll talk about that more in a future update. As far as residential use, Las Vegas also implemented an excessive use surcharge back in January. The effects of these new rates are already being seen locally, as we'll explore in just a minute. For now, let's get into our basin bin stories today with what everyone in weather is still talking about. El Nino. Now as I just mentioned, one key element of this perfect water storm in 2023 was the coming El Nino cycle and the effects it would have on the drought-stricken southwest. I realize from our viewer comments that El Nino hasn't been great for everyone around the globe, as it has brought heat waves and dry weather to many folks in other places. Here in the southwest U.S., however, El Nino might be seen as somewhat of a blessing, as another wet winter could be in store for the desert southwest if El Nino has anything to say about it. That's according to the Farmer's Almanac, at least, who promises rain and snow for southern Nevada if El Nino develops. Their winter 2024 extended weather forecast indicates that El Nino could bring rainfall to the southwest region of the United States should it develop. Fair enough, I think we established that theory already back in the April update. They go on to write, Should an El Nino materialize, it could direct the subtropical jet stream into California, translating into copious amounts of rain and snow across the entire southwest. The second week of January will be stormy, snowy, and wet for both the Pacific Coast and the Eastern States, the report says. The Farmer's Almanac claims to be 80% accurate with its forecasts, although research shows only about half of the forecasts produced by the Farmer's Almanac were correct. If you look at the report itself, it states, There are indications that an El Nino will be brewing in the latter half of 2023, lasting into the winter of 2024. The sobering reality, though, is that even a record year will not erase the drought, or the overuse and abuse downstream. Perhaps 5, 10, or 15, I would give you that, but right now, El Nino or not, historic snowpack or not, without adaptation and change, southwest population centers won't stay sustainable in these traditional arid lands. These changes, of course, cannot happen without adjustments to our modern lifestyles which will inevitably create pushback from some who may feel wronged by the new restrictions. As we can see in this article, families hit with excess water use fees and high water bills plan to push back. Now if you remember from the March video, we covered the updated water pricing tiers and excessive use fees that were just approved for the Las Vegas Valley. We got many comments from your viewers about how low even the new rates were. Well, apparently some Las Vegas Valley homeowners have begun getting hit with the excessive use surcharges and are telling a completely different story. Water bills are topping $1,000, even $2,000. That is a reality this summer for the top water users in Las Vegas. New excess use fees started in January for residential customers of the Las Vegas Valley Water District. Fox 5 talked to people facing those fines who say they are excessive, unfair, and plan to push back. Other locals show little sympathy towards these cases, pointing out that the user in this instance has a large lawn and a pool in the desert. What do you think? Will increased fees have the intended effect, or will they just squeeze the average family who is already struggling in this economy 
while leaving the wealthy to happily pay increased costs? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Now as Las Vegas continues to implement and advance conservation measures, other river users in the southwest are close behind, and may soon even surpass them, as the Phoenix City Council recently voted to leave part of their Colorado River entitlement in Lake Mead. Mayor Katie Gallego and the Phoenix City Council unanimously voted to leave up to 150,000 acre-feet of the city's Colorado River entitlement in Lake Mead over the next three years. We recognize that safeguarding the Colorado River is not just about protecting our city's water supply, but also about ensuring the future viability of the Southwest. Arizona recently announced a shortfall in their 100-year water supply, triggering a moratorium on building permits for residential homes that require wells. Well drilling permits for the controversial Saudi alfalfa farm Fondamonte were also recently revoked as we previously covered. It is illegal to grow alfalfa in Saudi Arabia because of the amount of water it requires, but Arizona's laws give those who own or lease land almost unlimited rights to extract water from their land. This was only recently met with opposition from the state. Of course, I have to mention the voluntary cuts from Phoenix come only after the $1 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act was promised to the lower basin states. I do know money talks, especially in this issue where water can be more valuable than gold. Perhaps that's what it takes, though. And perhaps other river users should follow the example and seriously consider a building moratorium if they can't secure a water plan well into the future, instead of city leaders being simple lackeys for the scorched earth developers and financiers. Regardless, what happens in Arizona is being watched across the United States and the world, and we will either see the state as a model for the country or as a warning to those in drought-stricken areas who are not willing to act. Meanwhile, construction roars ahead upstream in Las Vegas, with the new MSG Spear recently coming online, and talks of demolishing the historic Tropicana on the Strip to build a new A's MLB stadium. That's after building the brand new Raiders NFL stadium just a few short years ago. There are even plans for a new city, yes, an entire city, just north of Las Vegas called Coyote Springs. There is currently a legal battle over securing water usage for that new city that we are watching closely and will be covering more. So where's the rub? The water shortage definitely doesn't seem to be impacting southern Nevada much at all. In fact, due to rising Lake Mead levels, drought restrictions were recently eased, and southern Nevada will go back to a Tier 1 shortage from the more serious Tier 2A of last summer, as this article explains. Drought restrictions along the Colorado River will be relaxed after an exceptionally wet winter helped raise the levels of Lake Mead and Lake Powell. A Tier 1 shortage will be in effect for 2024, an improvement over Tier 2A restrictions currently in place. The difference? Southern Nevada will gain the right to use another 4,000 acre-feet of water. That's the equivalent of about 1.3 billion gallons, enough to supply 8,000 to 12,000 more households. But Southern Nevada isn't actually using all of their river allotment, and hasn't for some time. So instead, they bank that excess water for future growth and development. Information from the SNWA shows that Southern Nevada is so far ahead of the curve on conservation that the extra water probably won't be used anytime soon. Last year, Southern Nevada used 224,000 acre feet, and is on pace to use 19% less than that for 2023 if current projections hold true. So now you begin to see how all this growth is able to continue while using the same water allotment. But is it prudent to do so? In effect, current residents and businesses are conserving more, paying more, and being regulated more in order to subsidize future residents in construction. It's a sort of shell game with resources. And when the build-out and usage does reach its limit, will leaders be willing to regulate the developers then if they aren't now? On the other hand, should Las Vegas return all its excess water to the river, it would most likely just be wasted by less conscious users somewhere downstream. Without all river users on board together, it just results in a zero-sum situation regardless. At the end of the day, it seems it is still going to take federal intervention to finally equalize things between the basin states, and it's going to take more than taxpayer money too. We're going to keep light of all these changes as we work to start a new podcast also called The Park After Dark. So stick around, give a like or subscribe, and follow along if you're interested. We know you have a lot of places to get your news and entertainment these days, and we'd like to thank you for spending some of that time here. Special recognition goes out to our Super Thanks viewer last month, Xing Swing. 
We appreciate your modesty in saying no mention needed, but viewers like you are what drives us to create this content and we feel it's important to recognize you folks always, so thanks once again. Until next time, stay hydrated, stay happy out there, and we'll see you soon.